Hi, I'm Jack Farr. I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana, and I'm going to share a few cases with you on an interosseous bioplasty. In the first case, this involves the medial femoral condyle and medial tibial plateau. This is a male engineer, and I'm an engineer, so I can say this. They ask a lot of questions. They want to know all the details, all the options. So we had quite a long discussion. As you can see, he's had pain now for nine years. It's so bad that in the last six months, he can't play soccer. And this is what he lives for, is playing soccer with his friends on a weekly basis. His pain is intermittently sharp. There's occasional swelling and effusion, no instability. Specifically, he's not having mechanical symptoms. His range of motion, 0, 05, 145. As you can see, he has eight degrees of varus compared to five on the opposite side. So typically, I'd be talking to this gentleman about the potential of high tibial osteotomy or even a unicompartmental knee arthroplasty, and he was totally against either one of those. You can see his images, patellofemoral compartment, lateral compartment look good, medial compartment is narrowed, and you can see his varus malalignment. These are preoperative MRI. You can see marked bone marrow lesions of both the medial femoral condyle and medial tibial plateau. You can see marked chondral thinning, and he really has very minimal meniscus tissue remaining. So an arthroscopic, quote, debridement or cleanup, I, I don't think has any real role in this. So I discussed with him the option of a bioplasty, and specifically, I was not going to perform an arthroscopy. We were just going to treat the bone problems. What we're trying to do on any patient is find out what their bone generator is, what their soft tissue generator is, because if we can identify the pain generator and then we can direct our treatment at that, we hopefully will have a success. So what would you do in this case? Well, we've already, you know, cat's out of the bag. I'm gonna perform an interosseous bioplasty. So this is just the technique. You can see I injected both the tibial plateau and the femoral condyle. We wanna make sure that we have an adequate track. And in this case, I added to the preparation of bone marrow aspirate processed with Angel, I added uh, DBM. I also added just before the injection, thrombin and calcium chloride to affect clotting. This is a short video on the technique. These are the equipment that you need, just a standard drill. I use a guide wire, use some type of DBM and injector slash mixer. This is bone marrow aspirate. Currently I'm using more typically 50 mils instead of 30. And this is the angel unit separating the different components out. What I'm showing here is I'm trying to have the plateau collinear because I would like to come in and stay just parallel to the plateau. Certainly don't want to get uh, inside the joint. This is my guide wire. After my guide wire, I'm using a cannulated drill. This case uses a 3.5, and then I'm using the sharp obturator with a standard cannula with both end and side flutes. I'm making sure that it's cleared. During this time, my technician is adequately prepared, adding DBM granules or gel, and then mixing this thoroughly so I have a nice consistency to be able to inject. This is just one of the techniques for mixing. It's really important to mix it very thoroughly, otherwise it, it will clog up in the cannula as you're trying to inject. Typically, we obtain four to five milliliters total and then this is injected. This is a little dilute because this is an example. Typically I have a little bit more difficulty and I will have to reinsert the obturator multiple times during the injection. So this is repeated both at the tibial plateau and then up to the femur in a similar technique. Rehab protocol, I'm treating this analogous to a stress fracture reaction. So I'm having most of the patients, unless it's a very small lesion or it's patellofemoral, are going to be minimal weight bearing until they return at 10 days. And then we gradually advance them with a standard core to floor type of approach. But I'd really like them to wait approximately six months before they go back to their high level activities, specifically in this case, going back to soccer. This is 12 month follow-up and you can see a marked change from pre-op to post-op where most of the bone marrow lesion has resolved and he was able to go back. This is 12 month follow-up and he's back playing soccer on a weekly basis. So over the years, we've come to know about these bone marrow lesions. I think subchondroplasty 
really brought this to the attention of orthopedic surgeons. So now we started looking at the T2 fat suppressed images. And if we see these bone marrow lesions, then we're thinking that's participating in the patient's pain. We're looking at as a pain generator. So having evolved from subchondroplasty to now the interosseous bioplasty, I'm looking for these patients who have the potential of a significant portion of their pain be coming from the bone marrow lesion. Um, right now, we're just seeing this is, these are on anecdotal basis, case after case. Um, it's, it's important that we get science before we go further, so we are following these up. I've done over 70 similar cases, and we're, we have an ongoing registry where we're following these patients down the road, and really time will tell. Do these come back? When do they come back? Or is this a permanent solution in a subset of patients?